Okay, you guys, welcome back. Welcome back to the conversation. Listen, I've got a special guest with me today. <laughs> um, at the recording of <laughs> at the recording of this, <laughs> I'm laughing nervously. At the recording of this, it is currently the last day of March, so it's March 31st presently for us. But you guys aren't seeing this until I, you know, later. I don't even know when. I think I don't want to say it, but later in the year, because. Who this person is and what he has to say, I'm like, we need to work ourselves up to the space of being able to hear him. So I'm very excited for you to get to hear whatever he has to say today. Um, I have some ideas of things I think we might talk about, but I don't have a plan of what we're going to cover. I just want you guys to experience Josh. So this is Josh Scott. He is the pastor of Grace Point Church here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, there's more to him than that, but that's how he and I met. Um, so through Stan Mitchell, Josh took over Stan's church, and that's how we got connected. I'm so glad to have met Josh. Um, jo I'm going to let you introduce yourself just in terms of like who you are and what you do. Um, but Josh is a progressive Christian. He is a deconstructionist. He is a pioneer. He is daring and willing to go into spaces theologically that I, like made me uncomfortable when I first met him. And I'm like, that's impressive. You know, like I feel like I come into these spaces pretty considerate. And like we've gotten coffee multiple times. And the first few times we met, I was like, what? What do you what do you believe in what right? I was, so, I, would never, I was afraid I would never see you again after the first coffee, I'll be honest. I was like, that guy I'm never gonna hear from again. Did you really think that? I thought it was possible. <laughs> yeah. Because of my face or because of my questions or what? You just kinda it, you, there was a glaze <laughs> at one point. I was like, oh, this is I fire hosed this guy and and I'll never see him again. It's nice to know you, Mike. Yeah, there was a glaze. I'm embarrassed by that. But I believe you. I remember just being so shocked, which is part of why this is so much fun for me. Like, I'm not used to being that shocked, right? That was so new and refreshing and, like, jarring. It's awkward that that was visible, but... <laughs> so were you surprised when I was like, let's meet again? Yeah. I was like, oh, he wants, he wants more of that? That's like he's, in, he's interested in talking more? Yeah, I was... It was nice to hear from you. Wow. Nice. Okay, well, I'd love for you to get to introduce yourself sure. to them. Just who are you, what do you do, all the things, and then we're going to jump into it. Okay, sure. Well, my name is Josh, as Mike said. I uh, have been a pastor for 20 years, a preacher for 25 years. This year, I think, is my 25th year wow. as a person who gives sermons. Um, so you started preaching at five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started preaching about... I, I was 16, 17... Uh, when I started, when I gave my first sermon, wow. I had my first church job at 19, which is a whole other set of things I've had to process with my therapist. Um, but um, my wife and I have been married for 17 years this year. We have five kids, and um, this is my third year at Grace Point. I'm from uh, the Appalachian region, so eastern Kentucky, West Virginia border town. Uh, is where I grew up. Um, my family was, you know, my dad was a railroad engineer. My grandpa was a coal miner. I grew up in a holler. Wow, you don't know what a holler is, Mike? So ima like, uh, so imagine there's a, like a mountain and there's like a hole blown in the middle of it, and they they start a mine, okay. right? So it's it's essentially it was it began as a mining operation, and but eventually people started populating it. And lots of people, like that's, I'm from a, a, you know, a place where lots of people grew up in hollers. And they're technically hollows, okay. but nobody calls them that. They're hollers. My, my family was Free Will Baptist when I was born. My grandfather was a Free Will Baptist pastor. And uh, Free Will Baptist, like... Are you saying Free Will? Free Will. Okay. Yeah. So my, grand, my grandpa was the pastor, um, but, but he was bivocational they didn't believe in pay, paying pastors at this church some of them do but this one didn't king james only we didn't we didn't have an aversion to instrumentation but most of my life everything was acapella because nobody knew how to play anything uh until the karaoke machine got invented and then it was tracks and that kind of thing eventually there was a pianist when i was 11 my grandfather died and he died at church during a business meeting I kid you not, right after someone said the phrase to him, you're the problem and you should go. He died? He had a massive heart attack. Now, you know, so when people ask me, when did your faith start to unravel or when did you start to deconstruct? When did your faith begin to shift? When I was 11, 
at a church business meeting when my grandpa died right after somebody told him he was the problem and he should go. It, and I immediately had this response of, I believed in God, but I thought God was awful. God should have stopped it, right? Like that's sort of, you know, I grew up in this, with this, under this sacred canopy where God does all the things if we ask and we believe, right? So God, you know, God heals us. God gives us parking spots at Magic Mart, which was the store where I grew up. Grew up. God does all the things, right? If you do all the things. And my grandpa was a great person, and yet he dies in this church business meeting. And so that for me was the beginning of a faith unraveling. Uh, shortly after he passed, we decided to switch churches. Um, in what was seen as a liberal move, we became Southern Baptists. Uh, again, that gives you context for, you know, the, it was just a big, it was a big adjustment in some ways. Like theologically, going from King James only and you can lose your salvation about as easy as you can misplace your sunglasses or your car keys to eternal security, right? Uh, the NIV Bible. I had no idea there were other translations. I thought the King James was good enough for Jesus. It's the language. It's what Jesus spoke. It's good enough for us. And then there's this whole other world in that way that gets wow. opened up for me. Wow. And so, uh, you know, th those were my, my formative years were spent in those two denominations, which were really, really different. I started doing stuff in the youth group, which is the main reason we made the move. So I would have a youth group to grow up in and have friends and that sort of thing. Somehow I ended up being a leader. And I was, you know, so I don't know if, if your, your viewers know anything about the Enneagram. Uh, I'm Enneagram 7, so I'm here for the party. I was really shy as a kid, uh, really introverted. I still have that tendency when I'm not working. Like, when I'm not doing my thing, I could easily blend into the wall, <laughs> especially around strangers. But then it was, I was just super introverted, super shy, didn't have a ton of friends, wasn't cool. And somehow I ended up in this youth group and I got invited on um, a Sunday evening. Their music minister said to me, our, you know, the pastor's out of town, we're doing a youth service on this particular Sunday night. You're like one of our leaders. We would like for you to give like a sermon at devotional type thing. Would you be willing to do that? And I was also people pleaser. So I said yes immediately. And then was like, oh my God, what have I done? This is terrible. I can't get up in front of people and say things. Also, I had this whole thing in my mind where if you're a pastor, like it'll, the church will kill you because of what happened to my grandpa. I remember laying on my bedroom floor praying for the stomach virus. If I could just get sick, if I could just get out of this, and I didn't. So I got up on that Sunday night and gave uh, an 11-minute sermon on John 3.16, which I would wholeheartedly probably theologically denounce today. But at the time, there was just this experience, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what that was. I just know I have to do it again. I'm from the largest county in Kentucky. You can drive for hours. There are parts of it I've never seen. And so I was driving a couple hours, you know, to do so. I was preaching anywhere anybody would give me an invitation. Every holler and nook and cranny, every small church where three or four people were together, you know, I would show up and preach if they would invite me. And I had some really wonderful experiences and some really demoralizing, <laughs> terrible experiences. I had gotten invited to this church in a little town called Jenkins, Kentucky, which was in my home county, but I'd never been there before. It felt like it was two hours away. It may have been, it was probably an hour and something away. And so I went over there on a Sunday, it was a Sunday night. Their pastor knew my pastor. He was out of, their pastor was out of town, invited me to come preach. It starts at six, I'm there at 545. And there's no cars in the parking lot. Finally, it's six o'clock. It's the time when the service should start. And so I get out of my car and I go in and I open the door and it's unlocked, but all the lights are off. And I just go in and I sit down. About five minutes later, the door opens Three people walk in and flip on the lights. This one guy looks at me and goes, all right, let's get this over with. And I was like, no, no music, no announcements, no hi. So I get up and I give, I give this, t like, how do you preach? How do you, do, how do you perform any sort of activity when it's like, <laughs> let's let this get this over with? That was one of the worst. I'll never forget what I was wearing. I was wearing navy pants with a taupe mock turtleneck and a teal green sport coat. So I was dressed like the Joker from Tim Burton's Batman. That's me in a nutshell. Now, should you tell them some of what you do now, or should we just go on the journey of you like kind of sharing what your process had been like? Because I would like for them maybe to have some expectation of where this is going. But we could have fun and have them be surprised. Let's hear what's next in this story without knowing where this is going. Your involvement with the church now is very different. Theologically, your role slash function in it, what you believe about. All so I'd love to hear 
Okay, from that starting point, what happened? In college, I ended up pastoring a small church in a neighboring community there that went horribly. I grew up during, especially in the Southern Baptist context, during something that was dubbed the worship wars, where people are trying to figure out, is it okay to have drums and keyboards and like electric guitars as a part of, or is the piano and organ the divinely sanctioned instrumentation. This church hired me. I was like 20 years old and they were like, we want to grow. We want to reach the neighboring college. We want to have all that experience. We started doing, changing the way some things worked and more college kids started coming. And it was like, once that happened, uh, they were like, Hey, um, this is not great. Can you just like tell them not to come anymore? They just didn't like the way the church had changed and they didn't like all these new people. Most of them were related. I quit and I graduated and I moved down to Spring Hill, Tennessee um, to share a house with one of my best friends from college. And I wasn't doing anything. I was attending a church sometimes, but I wasn't doing anything in church. I wasn't really preaching regularly. I was working at a car dealership in the service department doing paperwork. And I just kind of wondered where my life was going and what was going to happen next. It's a really convoluted story, but I ended up getting uh, hired as an interim pastor of a church in a very small Kentucky town called Morgantown. And I ended up staying at Morgantown Community Church for 14 years. That's where I was at right before I came to Grace Point. What happened, though, is I was when I was hired, so I had that experience of sort of the beginning of my faith being challenged and unraveling when I was 11. But then when I was like 22, 23, some other things had happened. I, I'd been, you know, I started started reading and I started listening and there were just all these little seeds that had been planted all those years before that started to sprout and suddenly I was going to be hired as the interim pastor and eventually the senior pastor of this church what I didn't maybe disclose at the time because I wanted to get hired and I didn't really know what to do with it was the word people would use now is deconstruction but I was in full-blown faith unraveling mode didn't know what I thought about much of anything which made it really difficult to give sermons every week with any integrity. How could you be a pastor and have your faith unravel? What does that entail? All the plausibility structures, all the certainty that i would grown up with no longer seemed certain. When reading the Bible, like, is any of this literal? Miracles? Jesus deaf? What does it mean? All the things, right? Like all the things you'd imagine are central to the, the, well, this, I know this happened and I know what I believe and this is the way it is. This is the truth. None of it made, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint any, and, and I just couldn't pinpoint anything and say, I'm, I'm sure about that. By the way, there's very little I think anybody can pinpoint with any sort of like, know that you know that you know the certainty. Like, we're all, everything is ultimately faith. And faith is the, certainty is the enemy of faith, right? Because faith is ultimately trust. And so that's that sort of the rug of certainty was being ripped out from under me. And the more I would deep dive into biblical scholarship, the more that all the stuff I'd been told about the Bible was just up in the air and called into question. Right? Like, what even is this thing that we read from and I've studied and memorized my entire life? What, what even is that and what role does it play and what do we do? With, like, all of that. It was sort of like, I've never been at zero gravity, but imagine, like, hitting zero gravity and everything's floating, including you. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm not tethered to anything right now. I, the more I would learn about the Bible, like, how the Bible was composed, like, how the actual text got put together. It was scary because it was undermining the certainty structure, but it was also exhilarating because... One, it made more sense. Two, I wasn't trying to, I, I no longer felt the need to like make fantastical sorts of leaps to make things fit within the worldview I'd been given and understanding I'd been given. I, I actually just, I was starting to like, I, I'm going to follow this truth wherever it leads me. Well, it seems like truth. I will follow it wherever it leads me. Through the process, I actually, I would say today, I love, respect, cherish, engage the Bible now more than ever way more than ever. And so for me, it actually made the Bible a real thing. Jesus is more real to me now than ever before. Now, there are also people on Twitter who regularly tell me I'm not a Christian. So, you know, like choose, choose who you're going to believe. But for me, this whole Jesus thing is way more compelling than it ever was when I had certainty or when I was approaching it sort of in a, a literal way. If this is where you were when this was happening... Why were you going into becoming a pastor? I got hired at that church when I was 23. Um, and even then, like this is the sort of things that happens um, a lot in even the evangelical world I grew up in. is like you're, you're sort of earmarked 
for ministry. And so you spend all of your time and energy preparing for that so that you really are a one trick pony in the sense of like, what else am I going to do with my life? I have an English degree for undergrad, not even teaching, just like English. Like I, I went and read things and wrote. That's what I did. And so it wasn't like I had a ready-made career coming out of that. And also there was something about the whole thing, like getting up and talking to people, teaching people was still to this day is my favorite thing. Like I love getting up and talking about the Bible, talking about faith. And so I loved it. It was just one of those things where I would look out at the room and wonder if I told them what I was really thinking. I mean, these conversations became more public. Rob Bell would write a new book and it would come out and people would be talking about it. Or, And so, you know, I would start dropping things in the sermon, but I was, you know, there was still probably I would say things at one point vague enough, vaguely enough so that a person who wanted to hear it one way could and a person who was excited to hear it another way could, um, which I, you know, now regret that stage because it led some people to believe I was saying one thing while other people heard another thing. And I believe clarity is really important now as a result of it. I finally got to the point where I'm going to have to start talking about some of this. There's another way to see this that I've come across that actually is more compelling for me and, you know, begin to share some of that. And depending on what the issue was, right, like sometimes people embraced it and sometimes not so much. Your deconstruction started before you were ever officially like hired as a positional pastor. I didn't know that. That's crazy. So you went into this whole thing already like a traitor. (laughs) <laughs> if you will, right? <laughs> was there a certain sermon or teaching or whatever that you were starting to like put forward that you started feeling the backlash, maybe the beginning of, you know, what it would become? I can remember people being upset because like I had given a sermon on Jesus' death and I didn't say the things they were expecting me to say because I no longer viewed it the way I'd been taught to view it, right? I no longer saw the cross as a penal substitutionary atonement event and so figuring out how do we how do I talk about this in a way that's true to what I actually feel and believe that doesn't get me run out of town and I got invited to preach on Good Friday and so I end up doing the Good Friday sermon talking about the death of Jesus Jesus being executed by the Roman Empire and Easter being about Jesus being vindicated by God he's he's rejected by the Empire he's vindicated by God and that's I talked about you know what does that mean to have a Jesus who gets rejected by the Empire And what does it mean for God to say, actually, he was right? And so I finish. And then one of the other pastors stops me on the way out the door and gives me like a 20, 30-minute lecture on substitutionary atonement. And I was just going, yeah. It's like I I know what you're talking about because I believed it and heard it my whole life, but it no longer is the thing that compels me or makes sense to me about the Jesus story. How did you get to a point where you were so far from that pastor's worldview or theological lens how did you get there? I'd been studying the Gospels, right? I'd been studying, and I'd been studying what scholars say about the Gospels. And I was reading scholars that were questioning that. And some of what they was saying, were saying made sense to me, like it resonated. But then I, I think the moment for me that really just blew a hole in so much of that sort of thing, right? Like total depravity. This idea that we're born rotten sinners and that God can't be near us and that God's wrath, like, or that God would need to kill, especially kill something innocent, especially God's own kid, to somehow make us acceptable was the moment I held my firstborn. And I was like, I don't, I don't care what you do. There is nothing that will keep me from you. There is nothing that will stop my love. And so for like so much of my view of God was transformed in the moment I looked in this child's face for the first time and was like, oh. I can't imagine God going, I could just forgive you, but because you've offended my honor, something's got to die. We have literalized medieval theology and said this is what God is like instead of seeing it as the product of a specific era. We've read it back into the story. We've imported Anselm back into the story of Jesus, and we've read it. Instead of reading it from Jesus forward, we read it from Anselm backward. Or instead of reading it from Moses forward, we've read it from Calvin Luther backwards. And when you do that, you look through all, of course, you see it a specific way, and you begin to read into the text things that you've been told are in the text, which are actually things that were just like us today. So much of what we do is grounded in our lens that we're not even aware of. For me, it's always, and I think this is true, like I, this is what I see in Scripture, that experience is always the needle mover. And that's not unfaithful. That's, I think, actually think that's how God often works. 
One of my favorite stories is the story of uh, Simon Peter in the book of Acts chapter 10, where he's sitting on the roof and he has this vision of a sheet that drops down and there are all these unclean animals and the voice of God says, get up, kill and eat. And he's like, I don't, I don't eat. It's like, it's like he's saying to God, I'm way too observant for that. And God's like, don't call anything unclean that I've called clean, right? which is this invitation to, to the Gentile mission. But that experience then led them to go back to their text and to wrestle with what it means. The experience of Jesus for them led them to go back to the text. I mean, when you see the writers of the gospel say to fulfill the words of the prophets, nobody read the prophets that way before Jesus, right? The prophets were writing about other things, writing about, their, they weren't prophesying. Like Isaiah wasn't talking about 700 years in the future. He was talking about his own context, but the experience of Jesus, Jesus led these first Jesus followers to go, this is totally not what we expected. And we got to go back to our text and wrestle with it and see what we've missed. And they reimagined their text because they had to, they, they had to make space for the experience. And I think that's, that's how it works, right? And so my experience of becoming a parent led me back to like, what if I've been wrong about God? What if the way I feel in that, felt in that moment holding my firstborn, what if God feels infinitely more like that? toward all of humanity. What if that's the case? And I just became convinced it was. One question I want to ask immediately on that is, what would you say to people listening to you now who don't even, I have some things I would like for you to share. I'm realizing now as we're talking, I'm like, oh, we, for people who are listening to you and this is like the first they're maybe hearing of some of this or at least judging you for thinking those things, I would love for you to answer the question, how does someone in your position challenge or question or walk away from what they would say 2,000 years of church history, Christian tradition, orthodoxy, blah, 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 you know, this big establishment. How, how do you have the arrogance or the audacity to think that you're right and all of these people for all this time are wrong, right? I'd love for you to answer that. When you describe being a pastor in that context, I'm like, if I were you, I would feel like I'm lying every Sunday or like in that position, just not lying like I'm being dishonest, but like, like I'm having to hold myself back and play with chains or like handcuffs or one of my hands tied behind my back what was that like for you? I'd love to hear the experience there. The first, the first question, um, number one, nothing I'm saying is new. Nothing I'm saying is new. What people don't realize is that there is a myth that there is something called the historic Christian tradition that all Christians, everybody has always adhered to and believed. It's just not true. There's a great book that came out uh, end of last year, first of this year, called After Jesus, Before Christianity, that really it, these scholars dive into the diversity of the early Jesus communities. And this pops up in the New Testament, right? You, you find Paul writing things and arguing and saying, I know people have come to you and said this, but I'm telling you what my faith says. I'm telling you what my experience has said. Which means you have these moments where uh, in Galatians, Paul says, um, yeah, when, when Peter came down to Antioch, he acted one way with our Gentile brothers and sisters until the people from James showed up, and then he wouldn't eat with them, and I called him out to his face. You find the, them arguing about, can Gentiles be a part of this? You find that throughout Paul's letters, there are other groups of Christians, and they, or they weren't even called Christians then. These other groups of these other Jesus communities who see things very, very differently. And that didn't stop just because Emperor Constantine convened a council in the 300s. What that did is it created sort of a, I, listen, I don't like creeds. I think creeds are inherently exclusionary. They are immediately saying, in, the original creed from the Nicaea, Council of Nicaea actually has a line at the end that says, and if anybody says, and it gives this line that was popular at the council that they were working against. If anybody says this, if anybody doesn't adhere to this creed, they're out. What's the point of the creed, right? And I often think that sometimes the point of saying creeds on a Sunday morning is to look around the room and see who's not saying it. Or to just, we're all trying to convince ourselves we actually believe this stuff. Yeah. Nicaea and Constantinople and whatever. I mean, there's a reason we have so many different denominations in churches today. It's because not everybody agrees. And so this idea that there's ever been this one, you know, holy Catholic in the sense of universal where everybody agreed and everybody would sign on the line, it just hasn't been true. It created, Nicaea and other councils created the sense that that was true. And it definitely created a dominant group of powerful people who could, who could sort of decide who's in and who's out. Nothing I'm saying is new. Biblical scholarship and people who, you know, this has been around for a, quite a long time. You know, what I'm saying about the death of Jesus is not new. People have been saying it since the beginning. If you read the New Testament, like go, go read all of the genuine letters of Paul, the seven letters, all scholars of all stripes would say Paul definitely wrote those letters. We, we know that. The, others, the other six are disputed. These seven. And try to tell me what Paul's atonement theory is. Because here's what Paul does. 
Well, maybe it's this. Okay, that doesn't work. Okay, maybe it's this. Well, maybe it's this. Because people think Paul's writing systematic theology. He's building the plane as he flies it. That's what's happening in Paul's letters. He's in real time trying to wrestle with the needs and the questions and the experiences of communities while sort of staying true to his understanding of actually what Jesus, Jesus was beginning a movement of resistance against the dehumanization of the empire. And, and so how do we make sure we're still being faithful to this movement where we're making sure that everybody's equal, that everybody has a place at the table, that everybody has bread and wine to eat and drink? How do we make sure we're being true to the ethic of Jesus while dealing with challenges that Jesus didn't speak to because they didn't exist because this thing has gotten bigger than when Jesus was around in Palestine in the first century? Right, right like Paul's building the plane as he flies it. He's not giving a systematic theology. And the idea that we would think that that's over, I think is more of an abdication of responsibility than actual reality. I think that we're continually being invited to reimagine and reclaim and reframe faith because the very words of Jesus in the Gospel of John are, you're going to do greater things than me and there's a lot of stuff I wish I could tell you, but you can't handle it yet. This is an unfolding experience. I hope I'm doing so with humility. Uh, How do I know that I'm right? I don't. I don't know that I'm right. My conviction is that where I'm wrong, I am wrong because I did not lean far enough into love, justice, mercy, and compassion. Not because God is more wrathful and severe, but that I still have not become generous enough to fully understand. Okay, so that concludes part one of my three-part interview with Josh. He's going to get into some other deeper, maybe a little more shocking things as we go into this conversation. And I just want to let you know, those of you who maybe are new to this or intimidated by deconstruction or threatened or offended or whatever, if you want to step into the conversation or the process of just broaching the subject of deconstruction, like easing your way into it, I have a series on Numa Plus specifically about deconstruction. It's me just kind of talking about my process, the attitude, the mindset, the heart behind all these things, and then getting into some specific things about Christian, like, systematic theology, like doctrine that we've just been taught, most of us from a young age. Um, We're going to pull some of that apart there. So if you want to check that out, that's available. I'll provide a link below here for that. As well as if you want to be part of a group who is deconstructing together, people who've been in this space that I facilitate for months, almost a year now, um, we're thinking critically through things that we were just told from a young age to believe, and we just accepted for a long time. And now we're like, hey, Is that true? Is this good? Is this helpful? Is the result of this belief producing good in the world, right? So there's a lot of directions this goes in. If you want to get a little bit more aggressive about your approach in deconstruction and run alongside other people who are of the same priority of wanting to hold their theology accountable, this space is for you. I'll provide a link below for that as well. Um, And then as Josh is on social media, so he's on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. I'll put his handles below here so you can check him out. Um, depending on where you are in your process and your willingness to ask questions and delve into other schools of thought regarding what we read in scripture, regarding what we believe happened in the history of the church. Um, this may or may not be a great fit for you, but I would highly encourage you, if you're willing to look at some of this, Josh is a great voice to listen to. V- well-read, critical thinker, genuine heart. I-, I have such a mad respect for Josh. So, um, he's a great resource for you to get to like be invited into some other spaces. He has a whole blog of very thoughtful, well-written pieces on these things. So check those out if you'd like. Thanks for being here. I'm excited to release part two and three. Buckle up. It's going to get wild. All right. I'll see you next time.